Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. After watching the footage of the recent lecture by Zahi Hawass, I had to try and understand why he believes there is something hidden below the Queen's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. For me, this chamber has always been the most fascinating. Firstly, we have the two air shafts that don't reach the outside of the pyramid and are covered by small doors with copper pins on one side and loops on the other. The same shafts also did not open into the Queen's Chamber as well, as the wall blocks acted as a cover. In the same chamber we also have the famous niche, with some saying it once held a car statue, but others disagree, and the credible Arab chronicler al also wrote the chamber had a sarcophagus, identical to the one found in the King's Chamber. The floor of the Queen's Chamber was also not meant as the actual finished floor as well. Granite would have been set in place on top of the limestone. Either this granite was removed, or the final flooring was never laid. The step down in the horizontal passageway likely marks the position where the floor would go up to, and this would have made a square opening into the Queen's Chamber, just like we see in the King's Chamber. In the 19th century, Howard Weiss and Giovanni Caviglia found the Queen's Chamber encrusted in thick salt, which is a common occurrence in structures this old and made of limestone. But salt is incredibly destructive, and so, if this room was once plastered or painted or both, based on the observations of Howard Weiss, any such decoration would not have survived. This is relevant because Aladrizi also stated there was decoration on the ceiling, and this was seen more than a millennium ago. Aladrizi is one of the few credible Arab chroniclers, because what he wrote about the Great Pyramid was proven to be accurate. The main differences between then and now are the absence of a second sarcophagus, and also an absence of decoration in the Queen's Chamber but both of which are explainable by tomb robbing, human destruction and natural salt damage. Now, the most likely reason we see three burial chambers in the Great Pyramid is all down to the scale of the project. If Khufu died early, he could be buried in the subterranean chamber. If he died before the King's Chamber was finished, he could be buried in the Queen's Chamber, and the pyramid finished with a flat top like a mastaba. If the king lived long enough to see the pyramid complete, he could be buried in the very ambitious granite-lined king's chamber. For that reason, the king's chamber has long been thought to be the final resting place of Khufu. But the only problem with this idea is the cracked roof beams in the relieving chambers above, cracks that did happen during construction. There was clearly slumping or subsidence. There is evidence the cracks were filled with plaster, something the builders did to monitor the situation, to see if they expanded, and to ensure the king's chamber was not in danger of collapse. Obviously, the room did not collapse, but has stood proudly for more than four and a half thousand years. But would Khufu have trusted this? His place in the afterlife, his resurrection, the whole reason for building the pyramid relied on his burial, and because of the cracks in the beams above the king's chamber, I have a feeling there was doubt in the structural integrity of the room, and I've always thought that Khufu was laid to rest in the queen's chamber. The only real problem with the queen's chamber is a lack of security, no portcullis blocks and so on. Now, I was somewhat surprised, but also not surprised, to hear that Zahi Hawass believes the secret of the Great Pyramid centred on the Queen's Chamber, because I do think it is the key to the puzzle, and I think Hawass has this belief because of the work of Gilles Dormian and his 2004 book, Le Chambre de Cheops. I have to thank my friend at the History for Granite channel for sending me a copy of the book, which I've now managed to translate to English. Please do subscribe to History for Granite, because it's one of the best and most original channels regarding Ancient Egypt on YouTube.
He is extremely clever, knowledgeable and credible, and his research really is some of the best. In his book, Dormian does go into incredible detail, and I can't repeat all of his words and evidence in this video, as it would take me a few hours. But if by the end of this video you want to know more, I would advise you to buy a copy, but find someone that can read French. Firstly, by looking at the niche, Dormian discounts it as being ornamental and built solely for a car statue, as this would be somewhat strange compared to other examples of car statue housing. He believes the position of the niche, as well as its corbelled form, means it's more than likely functional. There are clear structural reasons behind its design, which I'll come to shortly. Then we have the tunnel in the niche. Whoever dug it in antiquity clearly did not believe that this niche was for a statue. At some time in history, what I'll call tomb robbers without a better term coming to mind, dug 15 metres into the masonry in an east-west orientation. You can maybe explain a couple of metres, but 15 metres does seem excessive. That's nearly as long as two London buses. Why did they do this? What were they looking for? I think logically they must have had a good reason. They must have been convinced that tunnelling 15 metres into limestone masonry at this specific point was a worthy task, especially because it was so difficult to do in a confined space. The first 5 metres was easy. The tomb robbers were finding regular squared blocks of limestone coming out, one after another and no compromise on structural integrity. They were not load bearing and they created a very regular cavity. But the next 10 metres is dug in chaotic fashion as the regular squared blocks came to an end. There is nothing to see in the final 10 metres to explain it, but looking at this view we can maybe understand why it was done. This central block is positioned in such a way that it would surely be a focal point for tomb robbers. You could see why they started tunnelling in this location, and after removing blocks very easily for 5 metres, it would have been viewed as an architectural feature. The robbers would have noted that this was surely on purpose. The first 5 metres of the tunnel are relatively neat, the blocks being easily removed. They would have been squared and well dressed, and it certainly looks like it's all been done by design. So the robbers carried on digging for 10 more metres, hoping they would eventually reach something in this direction. But instead of digging towards the east, they should really have dug down, because there is something in the first 5 metres of this tunnel that gives us a clue about what is going on. Back to the niche itself, and the corbel design as a way for the pyramid builders to reduce the load from the stone above. It's the reason the Grand Gallery also has a corbelled ceiling. So if the niche does have a functional design, it's there to reduce the load in this specific part of the pyramid. It's protecting something, and surely not just a statue. So, if it's not protecting something in the Queen's Chamber, it must be something below. It therefore makes it very possible there is an east to west passageway below the niche, and the first 5 metres of this tunnel had some function relating to the passage below. So, let's take a closer look at the tunnel. In this early part, the floor is flat like marble, and also plastered with gypsum. Experts noted it was very smooth. And there is also something very important to note on the floor. A cut rectangular cavity measuring 10 centimeters by 12. It's been filled with limestone and then plastered over with gypsum. It's interesting because this feature is inside the wall. It's situated behind the niche, only visible when the blocks from the hole are removed. So why was it filled with limestone and then carefully plastered over? What's the point if it is just a block behind the wall that was never meant to be seen? If it was just a defect, there's no need to repair it. Why go to this much trouble? 
This small rectangular cavity is attached to a joint. Three sides of it are cut into a block and the fourth side is formed by an adjacent block. If it was cleaned out, who knows how deep it would go. It's clearly functional, it's clearly by design, but being located in this position in the pyramid, well, there is no obvious function. Dormian believes a rope may have passed down into it, to raise and lower some portcullis blocks below, a conduit that went down to the proposed hidden passageway, and that is what the Corbel niche is protecting. Interestingly, directly above the rectangular hole, there is a huge lintel block measuring 3.35 meters long, at least 2 meters wide, and 1.5 meters in height. This is a 20 ton block of stone, but in the conventional view of the Great Pyramid, there is no need to have such an enormous block of stone in this position. It must have architectural significance, and Dormian thinks it's all part of the portcullis system, which he estimates is around 4 meters below. The next peculiarity of the Queen's Chamber is the limestone floor, above which was once placed a granite floor. This limestone floor does look a mess, with random and inconsistent sized blocks of limestone. I know it once would only have been beneath the granite, but still, you'd think the architect of the Great Pyramid would have made the job easier, and ensured the blocks were more regular in size and shape. Also in the middle of the chamber, we find another rectangular hole, again possibly for a rope to pass through, to maybe lower another portcullis block below. Today, this second hole has been filled in. Directly in front of the niche, some of the limestone flooring is missing, and that's because Howard Weiss and Giovanni Caviglia dug in this location in the 19th century. They did go down pretty deep, around 2.5 meters, but not as deep as Dormian suggests the passageway should be found at. If they had carried on, well, Weiss may have found a secret passage, and also, we can't discount maybe he did. The limestone floor is arranged in a strange way, suggesting something is going on beneath, and we can also see a number of round holes that have been dug in various places, and also a strange zigzag feature on the floor. Dormian suggests that these slabs are arranged in such a way as they were not viewed as floor slabs by the builders. They were looked at like a roof, and their arrangement is all in relation to the passageway below a passageway that runs directly beneath the Queen's Chamber. I could go into far more specific detail about this bizarre floor, there are so many observations and details I could go into, but that's why Dormian wrote a very detailed book. So, I've left a link to this book in the description below, but please note it is written in French. As stated, the floor also contains some deep post holes, and they likely did contain thick wooden posts, and these would have guided ropes connected to something very heavy, which can only be the portcullis blocks I've mentioned. So, there are physical observations inside the chamber and the niche that suggest that something's going on beneath, but what about the geophysics? Well, in the year 2000, a georadar survey was conducted, and what they found was astounding. There was a structure, around 1 meter or 2 cubits wide, oriented from east to west and crossing the entire Queen's Chamber. Its axis was 2.5 meters from the south wall of the Queen's Chamber, and its roof was 3.5 meters below. So, we have a corridor running under the Queen's Chamber, and that must indicate a chamber is below, either to the east or west of the Queen's Chamber. Because the axis or apex of the Great Pyramid is situated to the west of the Queen's Chamber, the Khufu Burial Chamber is most likely in this direction. There is so much more I could go into, so much I haven't mentioned, but Dormian took so many factors into account, the physical observations inside the room, the geophysical surveys, his deep background knowledge in pyramids, the axis of the pyramid and so on, 
Well, he drew these plans for how he thinks the corridors and chambers look beneath the Queen's Chamber. And here is the burial chamber of King Khufu. So the big question is, would it be intact today? Well, it's very likely the tomb would be completely intact, and from his recent lecture, it looks like Zahi Hawass does believe Dormian's theory. The only doubt I have, whether this tomb is intact or not, is the fact that al once said there was an empty sarcophagus inside the Queen's Chamber. Did this sarcophagus come from below, or could it have been a dummy sarcophagus that was placed in the Queen's Chamber to thwart off potential tomb robbers in the future? So, this is all well and good, but how do we gain access? Dormian's theory suggests the corridor runs below and across the Queen's Chamber from east to west, and so that means there must be a whole set of other passages that don't join up with the ones we know of. Or maybe they do. Maybe there are two entrances into the Great Pyramid, just like we see on the Bent Pyramid. Maybe one of them is still concealed. If not, the only connection point I can think of would be behind the large granite plugs at the bottom of the ascending passageway. Maybe behind these plugs is a second ascending passageway going up in a different direction, the route to take the true sarcophagus into the true burial chamber of Khufu, linking up with the passageway below the Queen's Chamber. It's very possible the King's and Queen's Chamber shafts were just ventilation shafts after all, simply used by workers in the construction. And so, Sibson's window could also be an intersection point where two ventilation systems from two sets of passages in the pyramid join up. This has been a very convoluted look at Dormian's work, but to be fair, it does seem credible, with physical and geophysical observations matching up. Zahi Hawass clearly believes it, and with more surveys being carried out in the past three years, new cosmic muon scans, new infrared thermography, photogrammetry and laser, well, maybe we should actually expect the unexpected. Maybe the secrets of the Great Pyramid are on the verge of being uncovered once and for all. Tomb robbing was always an enormous problem in ancient Egypt, and so Khufu's architect had to be clever. The subterranean chamber was unfinished and unsuitable. The king's chamber had major structural defects. The queen's chamber had no security features. And so creating a new burial chamber, an amendment to the initial plan, to be totally hidden from view is a work of genius. So is Khufu still inside the Great Pyramid? Is it possible we do have an intact burial chamber to explore? Only time will tell. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.